Greetings one and all, Super Wednesdays here on the hilltop, the holy hilltop of the Holy Apple in the Holy Land. Uh, we want to first uh, welcome back our cameraman from from uh, America. He came back here at Ephraim. also wanted to thank uh, Tzvi for uh, for taking over the job over the last couple of months. Welcome back at Ephraim. Okay, we are on the 11th day of the month of Elul, 5779, winding down the year. Put on a few seat belts here. Uh, we're going to go for a ride as usual. So, title of today's class Isn't it about time Israeli soldiers repent for the killing of Palestinians? You heard the question, isn't, about t isn't it about time Israeli soldiers repented for the killing of Palestinians? Now, you may be wondering why this subject this time of the year is pretty obvious, because tis the season, tis the season to repent, ta la 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 ti da la la Right? Tis the season. This is the time that the Jews are doing uh, tshuva, repenting, and it's unfortunate that we don't hear uh, too much. We hear we have to repent about, uh, about desecrating the Sabbath, or we have to repent how we speak, or what we use our eyes for and our ears to hear. But we don't hear too much about the subject of Israeli soldiers repenting, not even a discussion. So you'll hear it here first. Okay, let's take it from the top. King David. King David was gathering up funds to build the Holy Temple, the Beit HaMikdash. All of a sudden, in the book of Chronicles, Chronicle A, 22, chapter 22, verse 8. An amazing statement. Word came to me, King David says, that because of the fact that I spilled a tremendous amount of blood, and there were many wars that I was involved in. Due to this reason, I will not build, I will not be able to build the temple for God because of the fact that much blood was spilled by my hands. I will have a son, and my son will build the temple. Okay. Now, this is very interesting here. Temple represents prayer. We know that it says in the Ethics of the Fathers, there are three things that the world, three foundations the world stands on. One of them is Avodah, and Avodah is not work, Avodah is prayer. And we know, as it says in the Prophet, that the temple in Jerusalem will become a place for all righteous people to pray in the end of days. So, temple... Beit HaMikdash represents, one of the pillars is prayer. Second is sacrifices. King David comes and there's like a bombshell here, like, wow. He says, I am not eligible to build the temple because of the fact that I fought many wars. Folks, let's like, whoa, like wake up. Who did King David fight against? He fought against the enemies of the Jewish people. 
what in the world is going on? Because of the fact that King David saved the Jewish people. When you fight against the enemy, this is the Jewish people. What you're really doing is you're saving. You're protecting the Jewish people. This is like uh, uh, today there are many generals in the Israeli army that, uh, thank God, they can't go to too many places to, you know, they would love to travel around the world, but there's many, many places that if they step foot in that country, they would be arrested for war crimes. So, so they keep the halacha, they keep the Jewish law of not, uh, you know, not leaving the land of Israel. So this is, this is tremendously unusual. The hero of the Jewish people, King David, remember, the star of David. I thought he was our star. Now, if he's such a star, how come he can't build the temple? How come he's not allowed to build the house of prayer? Not allowed to build the house that we sacrifice, that we come close to God? I would think that King David was a catalyst to bring us closer to God. But folks, if you thought that was one a TKO, like pow, we got one more comment to you. This is the left hook. It says in Kings 1, chapter 8, verse 51. It says that King Solomon finished all the building of the temple. And King Solomon took all the money, jewelry, gold, silver, bronze that was donated by his father, King David. He gathered all that money and jewelry and he put it aside in the treasures of the temple. He did not use it. Folks, this is really bizarre. It's bizarre enough that King David, because of the fact that he protected the Jewish people, he went out and fought wars for the Jewish people and for their protection and to liberate the land of Israel. It's pretty bizarre that he's not able to build this temple. But more bizarre is that King Solomon does not, or refuses, or does not use all of his father's resources, silver, gold, bronze, money, jewelry, none of these resources for the temple. One of the commentators on the prophets is the Rolbag. So the Rolbag says on this verse, Excuse me, uh, chapter 7, verse 51, not 8. Okay, here's the summary of the Ralbag. King Solomon built the temple only after being in power four years. He did not build the temple immediately. And... The Ralbag, the commentator, is asking, why is that? Why didn't he, person would think, we know that there is a commandment to, uh, to be quick. When a person does a, 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 a commandment or when you do something positive, you should do it very quickly. The best possible time to pray is when the sun rises. So uh, that's like a special time and... Special people, I've heard, get up that time in order to, to grasp the first second where one is able to perform this commandment. So why didn't King Solomon, to build the temple, why didn't he do it immediately? It was only four years later after he took over. Listen to this. The Ralbag says, because King Solomon did not want to use his father's money or silver gold of his father. 
So the Ralbach says that just like God was not interested in King David building the temple because of the fact that he had participated in many wars and he had killed many people, so too King Solomon, God, and God were not interested in even using the money of King David, many, much of the money was obtained during various wars against the nations, spoils from the war. So this is like a one-two punch. We don't want King David to be connected in the building and not even his resources. Whoa! Heavy stuff. Prophet Isaiah, Yeshaya, chapter 1, verse 15, says the following, Prophet, when you lift up your hands, in prayer, many times if you Look how Jews pray. You'll see many times their hands. Some tea, you know, they say that Jews talk with their hands, but that people know. But not many people know that Jews pray with their hands. They also learn with their hands. You know, you ever see it's like uh, some kind of like dance that they have with their. So Jews use a lot of sign language, we'll call it. So. Jews would pray, still do, many, with their hands stretched up. Or also we know that the blessing of the priests, Birkat Kohanim, is also lifting up one's hands. Either way, prayer or the priestly blessing, the prophet Isaiah says the following, I will ignore your prayers. I will ignore your priestly blessing. No matter how much you pray, or how much, or how many times you say the priestly blessings, I will not listen to you, says the prophet in the name of God. Why? Because of the fact that your hands are filled with blood. This is an amazing thing. Once again, we saw with King David, there's a connection between prayer, the temple, which was a place of prayer. We know the temple, place where the priests would bless, Birkat Kohanim, and we see the same concept, not even connected to the temple that God will not listen to prayers of somebody that has blood on his hands, his or her hands. As we know, the prophet Isaiah lived in the time of the first temple. In the time of the first temple, one of the three cardinal sins that the Jews had transgressed was murder. It says, it says in the Talmud, Brachot, page 32, side B. It says that Rabbi Yochanan said, A priest, a Kohen, that has killed someone may not say the priestly blessing. Amazing. Rabbi Yochanan says, A priest, a Kohen, who has blood on his hands, 
has killed somebody, he is not allowed to say the priestly blessing. Now, maybe this is just uh, ideas, Jewish ideas. Maybe this is an idea, this is theology, but it's not Jewish law. However, not simple, because we see, we see that this is brought down in the Code of Jewish Law, Orachayim, the first book, Chapter 128, paragraph 35, or Law 35. I will read, I will read what the Law says. A priest who killed someone, who killed a, we'll call it a, a soul, Nefesh, even by accident, not on purpose, even by accident, that person should not be allowed to say the priestly blessing, not lift up his hands and say the priestly blessing. Even if that person, once again, we're talking about someone accidentally, not on purpose. King David did not accidentally kill people. He killed them on purpose. Here, it's even more bizarre. We're talking about a somebody, a Kohen, a priest, that killed somebody by accident, even if they repented. They are not allowed to say the priestly blessing. That's an amazing thing. Our title, I mean, maybe we have to change the title here. Isn't it about time Israeli soldiers repented for the killing of Palestinians? Maybe title should be that they should stop praying, or the priest amongst them should stop saying this priestly blessing. So, some of you out there might say, okay, it's probably talking about this law, how a priest is not allowed to say the priestly blessing. It's talking about if that priest killed a fellow Jew. We're not talking about, we're not talking about somebody that killed non-Jews. If somebody killed non-Jews, we would think they would be allowed. Comes, comes the commentator, Tzedal Derech. Tzedal Derech was Rabbi Yisachar. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. It's a doozer of a name. Eilnvorg. He was born... He was born close to 500 years ago, a little less than 500 years ago, in Poland. And he has a commentary on the five books of Moses, amongst other books. One of his most famous works was called, a book called Be'er Sheva. So he writes there, in the second book, the book of Exodus, the portion is Mishpatim, and it's in the first Aliyah, it's in the first few verses of that portion. And he brings down the following. He 
It says in the Our Sages Rite, on the verse, the verse is, Vichiazid ish al re'ehu leorgo beorma. If a person on purpose is hiding out in order to kill a friend, an acquaintance, the word in Hebrew is re'ehu. Now we have a principle. Wherever it says the word in the Torah, re'ehu, it's talking about Jews, not non Jews. So the verse says, if there is a person who planned and executed the killing of someone, even if that person is working, or even if that person has come to the temple to bring a sacrifice, you remove them. Whether they're a priest or a civilian, you remove them from the temple. Why? Because they have blood on their hands. So we see here, according to our sages, this is talking about a Jew killing another Jew. However, right after this opening statement by our sages, there is a dispute on this point. Comes, dum da dum da da dum da dum Isi ben Akavia. Isi ben Akavia comes and says, listen, I don't get it. Before the Jewish people received the Torah, it was forbidden, we know, God gave the seven commandments to Adam and passed, they was passed down from generation to Noah and his children, etc. So we know that before there was a concept of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, it was forbidden to kill someone. You want to tell me? Isi says, now you want to tell me? Before the giving of the Torah, I was forbidden to kill. Now that the Torah has been given on Mount Sinai, you want me to believe that now a Jew can kill a non-Jew? Before the Torah was given, you were not allowed to kill anyone. Now that the Torah was given, we're allowed to kill certain populations? That's too far-fetched. So, so what's the answer? So Isi ben Akavya gives the answer. What's the deal? After the Torah was given, if a Jew goes out and kills a non-Jew, they did something, they, they transgressed. They made a transgression here, performed a transgression. However, in a court of law, in this world of ours, they would not be held responsible. However, their judgment, the judgment call, would be given to God. So in the physical man courts, a person would be exempt. They did something incorrect, they transgressed, they made a transgression, exactly what the transgression is, that's not the purpose right now of our class, but they transgressed, however, in the court of law, they could not be held accountable for that. However, the decision, what will be with these people that killed will be given over to the Almighty. And therefore, that's our sages. Comes Rabbi Yisachar Eilenborg in his classic work, in his classic book called Seydah Lederich, and he brings down Rabbi Yochanan in the Talmud, in the tractate, of Brachot 32b, where it says, if somebody killed a soul, they are not, if a priest killed a soul, they would not be allowed to say the priestly blessing. And the, the Tzedah Lederich concludes, therefore, 
this prohibition of a priest to go up and say the priestly blessing because of the fact that he killed someone includes non-Jews. So, we thought perhaps what up until now we were we thought that perhaps the Jew, the law brought down in the code of Jewish law in chapter 128 35 we thought that perhaps it was talking about a Jew killing a Jew they were they were uh, they would be refused to bless the people with the priestly blessing if a Jew killed a Jew, but not a non-Jew. And here we get this slap in the face because the Tzedah Lederich says straight out, black and white, this includes what Rabbi Yochanan was talking about, that you are not allowed to say the priestly blessing if you have blood on your hands. It doesn't matter whose blood you have on your hands. You would be exempt. It, you would be ineligible. And also, if we once again read the Code of Jewish Law, it also seems like it's not making any differentiation between populations. I read again, a priest who killed a soul. It says, nefesh. Even by mistake, that person is not allowed to say the priestly blessing, even if that person did repent. Because we know that the priest would bless the people with the blessings of peace. How can you say a blessing of peace if you got blood on your hands? So, King David, we know, he didn't go around killing Jews. He went around fighting in the nations of the world. So it seems like, so far, like what in the world is going on here? It seems like so far, a person, a private citizen, private priest, or the king, the president of Israel, if you have blood on your hands, and it doesn't matter, because King David was not allowed to build the temple. He was not, even his funding, his resources were not used, because, so to speak, they have blood on those coins. He had blood on his hands. So therefore, it seems like we know he was fighting against the nations. There is no differentiation between killing a Jew or killing a non-Jew, and whoever, God does not receive their, God, God does not hear their prayers, God does not receive their offerings in the temple, and God does not listen to the, to the priests who bless the nation. Okay. Now, we hope we have up until this point everybody in suspense and now I said before take it from the top but now let's take two okay folks let's roll first question why didn't King David build the holy temple the first holy temple well Yehuda we asked that question about 20 minutes ago, and we gave an answer. Right. But now, we're going to look deeper, and we're going to see something entirely different. So, folks, put on your glasses one more time, wipe them off, because you're about to see an entirely different picture story. Hold on. It says, in the work of our sages, the book Yalkut Shimoni, in the 
writing section of Yalkut Shemoni. Yalkut Shemoni is divided into three, into the Torah, into the prophets, and into the scriptures. So if you look in the scriptures, 603, paragraph 603, in the book of Ruth, listen to this amazing take. Why King David was not allowed to build the temple. It says, it says in Chronicles chapter 22, verse 14, it says in the name of King David, King David cries out and says, I have prepared in my state of being poor, I have prepared and then a tremendous amount of money, of coins, silver, gold. So our sages ask, how come King David is calling himself poor? If he put up, let me just give you an example of how much money we're talking about over here. It says that he gave 100, 100 uh, kikarot, uh, like mounds of, of gold. Like a tremendous amount of money. It's like millions and millions of dollars. How can you be poor? Why does it say that? King David says, in my state of being poor, I gave all this money for the temple to be built. So first of all, first question is, how did King David get all this money? So here's the story. It says, when King David killed the giant Goliath, the women of Israel threw upon King David and soldiers threw coins, jewelry, silver, gold, bronze. King David gathered it all up from, from his men and he put it aside in a special fund, closed, what do they call them, hedge funds, for the building of the temple. Now, fast forward. All this time, you know, uh, I don't think he put it in the bank because I think there's zero, zero, zero percent interest, so you're not going too far with that. But anyways, he put it one, in one of these hedge funds. And all of a sudden, the Jewish people are facing a three-year famine. It's a long time to starve. It says every day... This is, by the way, also brought in the tractate. The story is also brought in the tractate of Brachot, if I'm not mistaken, page 6, side 2. For three years, every day, the wise men, the sages of Israel, came into the office of King David and they pleaded, Please, King David, open up. Open up your treasures. Open up all your funds and please give money to your poor Jewish people who are starving. Every day they would come to King David and his bottom line was, the, the Talmud discusses a various, conversa various conversations. But the bottom line of King David was, listen, this money is very special. This is going to build the holy temple in Jerusalem, the most holy place in the world. With all my love for the Jewish people, these poor people that are suffering, we're talking here about God's house. How can you, when we're discussing God's house, how can you give away money that was made for God's house and give it over to poor people with all, I mean, identify, I identify with the, with the suffering of the Jewish people, but 
when it comes to respect, when it comes to who do we, who do we honor first? God, God, and building His house before mankind. So, but, I'm not just going to leave it like that, says King David, because I really feel terrible that the Jewish people are suffering. I love the Jewish people. So here's my suggestion. You people go out, and you go to war, and therefore, when a person goes to war, we know that many times in the world, uh, e economically speaking, uh, countries went to uh, war because they were broke and they needed funding. So this was an easy way, and you know, you paint a certain picture why you, you, the way that you want it to be perceived, but really, that's why you're going. Uh, most wars, there's some kind of financial uh, issue behind why people are going to war. It's not just because we have, we're proud and we're waving our flag high. Usually there's money, oil, assets that are involved in why we go out to war. So, King David says, listen, this is not an obligatory war, of course. Obligatory war would be to defend the Jewish people. Obligatory war would be to go out and to conquer the land of Israel, to uh, liberate the land of Israel. So these kinds of wars are called Milchemet Arashut. They are not obligatory if a person wants to, if the king gives the green light, then you are allowed to go for a non-obligatory war. So that was his advice day in and day out for three years. God said to David, I can't believe what I've seen. David, what's going on over here? You let your people down. You refused, okay? You let people die because of the fact that you didn't step in and give them money in order to buy provisions, to buy food. Because of you, King David, people died. Jews died. I swear, God says, you will not build my house. You were keeping the money to build me a house to honor me? I'm telling you, David, that more important than honoring me, more important is giving charity to poor people, people that are suffering, people that are in a famine. That is more important than the house of God. And therefore, you will not build the temple because of the fact that because of you, David, many Jews perished during those three years of famine. Why didn't King David build the temple? We're moving right along. Listen to this. God tells David, listen, David, you're not going to build a temple as we quoted from Chronicles 22.8. You will not build a house for the, my namesake because of the fact that you have spilled much blood. When David heard these words, that he was not going to build a temple because of the fact that he had spilled blood, in wars, David became frightened. David became frightened. He was thinking about all those wars, all the nations that he'd killed, all the soldiers. Palestinians of those days. And he became frightened. He said, oh my God, because of what I've done, I am no longer eligible to build a temple? Oh my God, what a nightmare. 
God stepped in, so to speak, right away when he saw that David was astonished. David was shocked. David was frightened. Maybe his whole life was in error when he stood up for the Jewish people to fight for the Jewish people against the enemies of the Jewish people, protecting. It was all, it was all a mistake. You know what it is to wake up and you made a mistake your whole life? I mean, that is a hard thing to live with. And God said, David, have no fear. All the blood that you spilled, King David, all the blood that you spilled in these wars, they're to me like sacrifices in the temple. Like sacrifices of animals in the temple. All, all, the, all the enemies of the Jewish people that you killed, in, uh, my, in God's eyes, in my eyes, God says, they are all like sacrifices before me. Amazing thing. All the people that King David blew away, they were all, each one, each person was considered as David bringing a sacrifice to the holy temple and coming closer to God. King David says, time out, baby. I don't get it, God. Didn't you just say that because of the fact that I've spilled so much blood during the wars that I am not able, I'm not eligible to build a temple? And now you're telling me that all the blood, all the people that I killed to protect the people of Israel, you accept as a sacrifice to God, coming close as possible to God? So why don't I build the holy temple? If I was wrong in doing what I did, I can understand. But now you're saying a horse of a different color, that everything that I did all my life was the correct path. And all the people that I killed, that was the correct thing to do. And it was as if I sacrificed, as if I sacrificed before you, thousands and thousands and thousands of sacrifices during the years. That's pretty close. We know in Hebrew, the word sacrifice is korban. That brings us closer to God. So I don't understand. Why can't I build a temple? If there's nothing wrong with what I did, if I did not commit any war crimes, if they're not going to arrest me in Hague, why won't I build a temple? And God said, I know, David, let me explain why you can't build a temple. Because I know the future. And in the future, the Jewish people will sin. And then there will be a choice. What do I destroy? The Jewish people or the temple? David, if you build the holy temple, it can never be destroyed. Therefore, I will have to destroy the Jewish people. So I'm sure, David, your whole life was dedicated to the Jewish people, love of the Jewish people. I'm sure you would prefer, and so would I, so to speak, God says, that the temple be destroyed and the Jewish people survive. So David, the reason why you can't build the temple, because anything you touch, David, is eternal, and I cannot destroy it. And if I cannot destroy it, I know that the Jewish people in the future will sin, and I will have to decide to destroy the Jewish people or the temple. Now I have no choice, because I can't destroy the temple, because you, David, you're such a righteous person. You are an eternal Jew. King David lives, as we say in our prayers, David Melech, Chai Vekayam, you are eternal, alive forever. Anything you build, anything you touch, is for eternity. 
So therefore, I cannot allow you to build a temple. But your wars were 100%. Your wars were like service in the temple, pleasing in my eyes. It says in Tractate Sota, page 9, side 1, there were two righteous people in all of history who were eternal. <clears throat> anything they built, anything they touched, would be for eternity. Talmud says, in the name of Rav Chinana, the son of Papa, there's a verse in Psalms 33, 1. Tzadikim ba Shem laisharim navati la. Sing joyfully, O righteous, because of Hashem. For the uprise praise is, fit, is fitting. Thank Hashem with the kinor, violin. Sing him a new song. So, this verse of King David, Psalms 33. So, Rav Chinana says, don't read... Don't read Nava is fitting. Read Nave. Nave is your building. Nave. Ella Nave Tehila. This, who are we talking about? What building should we be praising? The buildings of Moses and David. Why? Because the enemies of the Jewish people were not able to destroy anything that Moses or King David built themselves. Anything that Moses or David touched would remain eternal. In the times, in the case of David, when the Gentiles came to destroy the first temple, certain objects that King David had, uh, had prepared were swallowed up in the ground and today are still there, underground, in a treasure. The Gentiles were not able to destroy what King David produced what his son King Solomon produced they were able to destroy the nations of the world and the same thing too is with Moses what Moses produced when it came to the tabernacle in the 40 year period of the desert that was once again swallowed up and hidden under the ground in various tunnels and was never destroyed by the nations of the world. So these are, according to the Talmud, we see very clearly, we see very clearly what our sages are talking about during this conversation between King David and God. When David was so upset that he wasn't going to build the temple, he was so upset that all of his life work to protect the Jewish people and all of his wars against the nations of the world were a transgression. He's not able to build the temple. He's not able to, to come close to God. And then God says, no, you got it all wrong. All of the, all of the nations, all of the enemies of the Jewish people that you blew away, in my eyes, they're considered to be sacrifices in the holy temple. Well, if that was a positive thing that I did, then why can't I build the temple? No. David, anything that you build is eternal. It can never be destroyed by the nations of the world. 
and therefore I don't want to destroy the Jewish people, I'd rather destroy the temple, a physical building of, of, of sticks and stones. So therefore, that's why we see in the Talmud a, a strengthening of this opinion that King David was an eternal figure. Okay, so <clears throat> we will one, uh, one more step and then we'll continue with God's help next week. Don't touch that dial. Stay tuned. Question is, we have a verse... We have a verse in the Chronicles. Chronicles 1, 29, 9. It says there that the Jewish people were extremely overjoyed, extremely happy, joyous that they donated the money for the first temple. In this chapter, Chronicles 29, it talks about how King David himself also gathered funding resources for the temple as we've discussed today. In this verse, we see that the Jewish people also volunteered much resources in order to build the temple. And it says that in this verse, 29.9, that the Jewish people were so happy to donate this money. Why is that? Listen to this amazing idea. The Jewish people realized that everything King David touched, including his money, was eternal, including his silver, bronze, gold, jewelry, diamonds, anything King David touched was eternal. Now they were afraid. They understood that King David was not going to build the temple. However, they still feared they still feared that King David's money would be used. In fact, it's amazing. As we read in the beginning of the class, we said that King Solomon in Kings 1, 7, 51, chapter 7, verse 51, we said that when King Solomon finished, he, he stored away in the side, in the treasure on the side, all the money and all the resources that his father had prepared. He too was afraid. King Solomon, as well as the Jewish people, understood that if, even if only King David's money, not King David building the temple, but even using the resources, King David will have no part in the physical building of the temple. Okay, I got it. No, that's not enough. Even if his money is used, that temple will not be able to be destroyed. And therefore the Jewish people were so happy because they knew that if the temple couldn't be destroyed, the Jewish people would be destroyed. Now that they saw that King Solomon was not using money given by King David to build the temple, they were overly joyed because they understood that they would be saved. One day they would be saved fact that God could destroy the temple because it wasn't used, the money that King David had gathered, had raised, would not be used, and that money, money, because it's connected to David, is eternal, and therefore the Jewish people would have been destroyed. So this way, that is why they were so overjoyed. This is brought down in the book... 
Ateret Paz, page 65. Ateret Paz, 65. So, we see King David, an amazing, an amazing figure, an amazing righteous person. Anything that he produces, and even something that he doesn't produce, but it's his resources, even if it's used by other people, that too has a status of being eternal. So folks, don't touch that dial. Please come back. We're really going to keep on hitting it hard. Returning to our question, isn't it about time Israeli soldiers repent about the killing of Palestinians for the killing of the Palestinians so with God's help we will see